Kia ora internet. We're about to visit somewhere that I learned about in primary school and have never been, which is the village that was buried by the explosion of Tarawera. Or at least we would visit it, except for this is Tuesday. So we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> We're back here again. It's a bit wetter today, but fingers crossed, it's not actually raining at this exact moment in time. It was very heavy rain again last night, but it seems to have stopped for a little bit. So we're going to try again for the buried village while we've got the chance to. We've been through the little museum, which was incredibly moving, actually. There's just lots of stories about the, the people who were killed here. So I think, like most New Zealanders, we did Tarawera as a unit at primary school. Well, we did disasters in Tarawera. Yeah. There was a big bit of it. And you sort of heard the story of that there were the pink and white terraces, which were this big tourist attraction kind of similar to some of the things we saw yesterday but um, on a much much bigger scale. The village that stood here was built for tourism because visitors would come here for the pink and white terraces. They'd stay here and then they'd be taken by a guide across the lake to the terraces. And then one night there was a massive eruption and the terraces and a whole load of surrounding villages were destroyed, covered in mud, and um, this village here was one of them. And I'm a bit vague on the history, but thankfully the person in the um, reception told us most of the history. So there were 121 people, I think it was, it was 120. Yes, it was 120-ish people killed here and in the surrounding villages, mostly in the, the cl villages closer to the lake, which was New Zealand's biggest disaster, biggest natural disaster until Christchurch, which was 134 people. Yay, we win. Mm, yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're now going to walk around some of the, I guess, reconstructed homes around here from the... There's like little cottages that were part of the village or might have been transported from elsewhere, I'm not really sure. So Jay can read signs, which I can't apparently. <laughs> yes. So this one was built in 1860 and it was in Ohine on the shores of Lake Rotorua. So similar houses were built here. So this one is not here, but similar style. This is the entrance to where the actual village to Wairoa used to be before the eruption. So this is an excavated furry and down in the puddle down there is where the floor of it would have been because you can see the little fireplace. So you can see from how high up the banks are around it that's all the depth of mud that fell on the village. And this village wasn't as badly affected as some of the ones closer to the lake. She said there was like 20 meters of mud fell on some of them. Yeah. Which is just, I mean, that, just looking at that there, that's a lot of mud. It's like 10 times that. This furry has been reconstructed, but gives you an idea of what at least the, most of the Maori inhabitants of this village were living in. Some were living in Pākehā style houses by the time of the eruption. The interesting thing in the museum that said that a lot of the furry survived where the European houses didn't because they had such steeply sloping roofs that the mud like flowed off them. And most of the people who survived in this village survived because they all took shelter in one of the furry. This is part of the house where the hotel employees lived. So this line of tree stumps were not deliberately planted. They actually grew out of a fence. The fence posts were made out of poplar 
and the fence was almost completely buried by the eruption but because the volcanic mud was so rich the fence posts sprouted into trees and so there was a big line of poplar trees along here until about 10 years ago when they got so big and old they started falling down so they had to cut them all down but they left the stumps here as a reminder of the fence line that was here So this is a pataka, which is a storehouse. was amazing in lots of different ways. The, the history is moving and scary, especially because yesterday they put Taupo on alert level one for the first time in ages, which means it's officially not a dormant volcano anymore. It's now a potentially active volcano. Though not in any threatening way, just a, we should keep an eye on this way. So, reading all the history of this place and knowing that there's another lake just up there that could do the same thing is kind of an interesting experience. <laughs> but also just walking through the bush and it's so peaceful here and then the really amazing waterfall which is well worth the incredibly steep steps to get to it. That was fantastic. So it was thoughtful, frightening, peaceful and invigorating all at the same time. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this little visit. Don't forget to do all those nice internet-y things like liking and subscribing and leave a comment and I will see you next time. Kakite ano internet. And just in the distance see Lake Tarawera where yeah I got it right <laughs>